Hi, on today's show, I'm gonna be sharing about visions of hell. It's gonna be intense. You're not gonna to wanna to miss it. Do you already think you know what heaven and hell are all about? Is there nothing more to know and nothing new to learn? Let Lori Ditto open your eyes to the unseen world as she shares from the heart what she has learned when God took her to both places. She reveals all the wondrous workings of a glorious heaven and all the unspeakable horrors of a hell to be avoided at all costs. What you will see and hear is beyond your imagination. Join Lori Ditto and make today count. Hi there, welcome, I'm Lori Ditto. This is Make Today Count. And that is so important that we decide for each day to be important and to live like it is the most important day of our life, because today really is. I'm gonna to get to share with you today two small visions of hell. And I know there's no such thing as a small vision of hell, but I actually have a third vision of hell where I burned in hell. So that's why I'm gonna call these too small, but there is nothing small about hell. And it's gonna be intense. So I'm just forewarning you. Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. Why? Jesus is so merciful. You see, there's only one way to heaven and that is through Jesus Christ. But there are many ways to go to hell and Satan is setting traps for each of us in hopes that we would fall and fall into hell, that that would be our choice. And so God has showed me these two visions of hell and I learned a lot from them and I believe you will too. First, let me read a few scriptures. I'm gonna read four scriptures. The first one is in Revelation 21, verse eight. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Ah. Psalm 9, verse 17 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations who forget God. Uh-oh, let's read number three. Matthew 13, 49 and 50 says, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. One more, Matthew 25, 41. This is Jesus talking. He says, then he, meaning himself, he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Oh my gosh, there's a lot, lot more in the Bible to talk about hell. Hell is real. Demons are real. Hell was made for Satan and the demons. It wasn't made for you, it wasn't made for me. But Satan knows the only way that he can hurt God is because God set a precedent. Sin has to be separated from God and because sin is separated from God, the place of that separation is hell. Hell is a place that has no life. There's no love. There's no water. There's nothing good there because God is not there. God doesn't want anyone to go there. And too many people are headed there right now. There's gonna be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let me tell you what that's like. So there is no such thing as weeping and it being positive. Weeping always means negative. And so that you can kind of track with it, if you've ever lost someone, if someone that you love has died, maybe a pet, that weeping, 
that knowing that it's gone forever, that's what Jesus is talking about when he says weeping. Gnashing of teeth, we don't use that vocabulary much anymore. Because in this nation, if you're really sick and hurting, we medicate you. So this gnashing of teeth means you're in so much pain. You are in so much pain when you are in hell. Oh, we need to do everything we can do to stay out of hell. And I believe Jesus, because he's put me on this bridal march, he wants me to help more people. And to do that, I need to understand more about where they're going. And the Bible is really, really filled with it. So in Mark 9, 43, it says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. This is really serious. It's a really serious topic. The scriptures teach we need to be perfect. Perfect? What does that mean? It means don't willfully sin. If today you're not willfully sinning, God counts it as perfect. And if you're perfect, you're on your way to heaven. As Christians, we kind of check out, right? We don't, we don't aspire to being perfect. These visions, I think, will help you change your mind. Sin is terrible. It came in with Adam. And since Adam, all people have sinned. We could say all people are headed to hell, except, except for the ones who accept Jesus Christ as their savior. And so if you've already done that, then you're safe. In the garden, there are two trees. Adam had two trees. One was the tree of life. The other was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Life will never hurt you. But that second tree, the tree he wasn't supposed to eat from, the knowledge of good and evil. How do I explain that? Well, when I tell children about it, I tell them, go scramble me an egg. They open it, they take the yolk, they take the white, they scramble it all up, here you go. I said, now, unscramble it. Because that's the knowledge of good and evil. Unscramble it because the evil will hurt you. The scriptures teach we love our sin the evil will hurt you. You can't, you can't unscramble it. That's why that tree is a no-no. And when Adam sinned, what he could have, would have, should have did was say it's all my fault, but he didn't. The good news is Jesus did. Jesus is known as the second Adam. And all of this is important for us to not lose hope when we hear about hell, the place that was created for Satan and the demons, we don't have to go there. And as I share these two visions, I need you to know that Jesus is the second Adam. He will save you. The blood that he shed on Calvary is more than enough. It purchased us. It purchased us from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation so that we can all, all, be in heaven with him. This is really exciting. I'm going to take a break right here, but when we come back, what I want to do is share these two visions with you. Make sure you come back now, okay? Lori Ditto had 15 remarkable visions where she was taken to heaven and even firsthand experienced hell itself. Now she travels around the world as an evangelist and seer, where she shares straight from the heart the life-changing lessons she learned, backing them up with scripture and biblical truths. Lori has been called to speak and prophetically minister to people in matters of repentance and sin, humility, how unforgiveness can affect our destiny, and how the daily choices we make can either reflect God's heart or lead us away from God. Her desire is to see people escape hell and live out the principles of heaven here on earth. Through her books and additional trainings, conferences, and church meetings, Lori works to equip others to fulfill the Great Commission. 
Log on to MyFathersReputation.com where you can find out more about her ministry, products, watch her videos, and much more. Hey, welcome back. I was just getting ready to share these two unique visions that Jesus showed me of hell. The first one is on a mountain top. So when I check into this vision and the Lord is using the vision to train me, I am on a mountain. I can see to the top of the mountain and I see that my help is needed more towards the bottom of the mountain. But you had to be very careful on this mountain because God didn't put people on the mountain. He did put me there as a worker. I am a worker of the harvest. So he did put me on this mountain. But when you get on this mountain, you get on it from Satan. And if you fall off the edge of this mountain, you fall into hell. So there I was, I was working on this mountain. My job was to stop people and to talk to them about where will you spend eternity? Do you know the reality of hell? Very unpopular topic. Nobody really wants to hear about hell, but my job is to stop them and talk to them. Now above me is this, for lack of a better understanding, let's say it's a, it's a military helicopter. It belonged to God. This, um, this unit that was able to carry people off of that mountain. And there were lines, the angels were helping. There were uh, safety lines, for lack of a better understanding, that had a hook on the end of it. And this hook would drop down and its purpose is to snag you wherever, it doesn't matter, snag you so that it can carry you safely up to this unit that will take you off the mountain. And I'm a worker on this mountain. And um, I keep realizing I got to get further and further down because at the top of the mountain, the people can't see there's any, um, that there's a problem. So I keep moving down and so do the other workers. There are evangelists on there. There's intercessors on there who understand about God not wanting people to perish, but there really aren't that many workers. And the closer I get, to the edge of this mountain, I had these military boots on that were really remarkable. They had some sort of magnet in them that could root me and ground me into not only the love of God, but into his word. And it's his word that gives us life. And so as I'm standing there and I'm scrooched down, I see other workers, they're doing everything they can do. They want to get low so that they can make sure that they've hooked you somehow, that there's more of you for them to hook. Okay. And it was so upsetting because I would stop and talk to somebody. And at first for every one person I spoke to, 25 of them fell off the mountain and went to hell. Imagine that one out of every 26 people were going to go to hell, but I could convince some of them. It took some time, but I could convince them. And Satan didn't want any of the people once they were on this mountain to be able to be lifted off of it. So he poured this oil. Now we know with God, there is an oil that you can get in the presence of God. And Satan was pouring oil on this tree, mockery. This mountain, he was pouring oil. It was mockery, mockery against God, mockery against the people. And you know, he was trying to get the people to offend me. But in this job, you can't be offended. So I would stop the people, even though they were sliding. And I would say, you're in danger. Say yes to Jesus right now. Say yes. And some of them would say yes. And they would be hooked. And there were others that just laughed at me. You can't imagine my anguish knowing they're falling into hell. And Satan was gleeful. It was a wicked gleeful of him taking all these people to hell. There were leaders. Let's start first with people who said they belong to the church of God. And they were telling their people, it's okay to sin. 
Now there's lists in the Bible of things that you cannot do. Sexual immorality is one of them. Drunkenness is one of them. You can't do these things. And there were leaders who say they belong to the church of Jesus. They had their whole congregations. It's okay, sin. God will, God will understand. And they would rather listen to that lie than to the truth. Multitudes of people went through and there were all kinds of leaders. Don't listen to them. Just don't listen to them. It was so frightening. People after people after people after people. We were doing everything we could do. It was overwhelming. And I heard the voice of another evangelist yelling to all of us, don't you grow weary in doing this good work because we could save some. And this man went past me, sliding past me, People, it was such mockery. They, they were acting like it was some sort of slip and slide. But this man, he said, help me, help me, because an evangelist higher up had talked to him, but he couldn't hook him. And he was hanging on, just hanging on by his fingers. And I reached down and I hooked that man. You would not believe the gratitude that was on his face and it just gave me more strength. And I was crying bitter tears. Oh God, multitudes of people, multitudes of people were going to hell. It was taking its toll on the workers. It's too bad there weren't more. It wasn't that there wasn't enough lines dropping down. There were plenty of lines. It was that Satan had convinced them not to listen to the truth of the Bible, not to take the Bible at what it means. That's for those religious people. No, that's for the children of God. That's for the people who love Jesus. That's for the ones that he saved, that he's redeemed. This is an important thing in your life and you need more of it, amen? It was so intense for me. And the second vision is just like the first one. So intense for me. I believe the second one hit closer to home. It really made me realize I spend time going to talk with strangers. I go door to door. I knock on doors. I try and convince people that they need prayer in their life. And if they'll say, yes, they need prayer. Then I start talking to them about Jesus. And I say, tell me about your life. Tell me about how you got saved. And even though people will take prayer, they don't know Jesus yet. Hallelujah, I'm there. But this one isn't about strangers. This one in my world was about my family. And when this training vision began, the Lord opened it up with my granddaughter. She's the oldest one, but at the time she was small and we were on the most amazing playground, definitely a heavenly playground. You could not get hurt on this playground. The trees in heaven are so remarkable. The branches reach down and the vines reach down and you swing because the, the tree will swing with you. It loves to swing children. And it will play with you. The tree will play with you. If you can't climb the tree, it will help you. You're not going to fall. You're not going to get hurt. And there was this bouncy stuff. The grass in heaven's bouncy, but this was some bouncy stuff. So if you fell down, it was as if you did it on purpose. And then while you're down, this bouncy stuff could tickle you. It was a great playground. And I was over sitting with other adults talking about something that probably wasn't very important considering what had happened. But my granddaughter wanted to go play in the field. And I thought, go ahead, you're safe. I didn't realize there was a gate out there. 
And there were people on the other side of the gate that her innocence and her purity stressed them out because they didn't have that anymore. And they convinced her to come on the other side. Her name is Jerusalem, my oldest granddaughter. And what had happened was on that side, they were convincing her that people who give you too many rules, they don't want you to be yourself. They just want to control and manipulate you. And the playground on that side of the boundary, in the dark area, it wasn't a safe playground. The slide that she went down was too hot and it burned her. And when she fell at the bottom, there wasn't spongy grass. There was only cut up glass. And before I knew it, that's where she was. She was in a dark, 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 dark place. My grandbaby was in this dark place. She did get out. And when we come back, I'll tell you how that happened. The alarm is sounding. Heaven and hell are real. Where will you go? In Lori Ditto's book, The Hell Conspiracy, she shares her firsthand encounters of hell and the painful consequences of her own sin and unforgiveness. Through these pages, you will experience the stark terrors of a place where there is only hatred and no way out. They are six, between six and seven feet and when I passed through, then all of a sudden these gates slammed shut. You would not believe the sound of those gates. It hurts my ears. It hurts my ears to even think what that sound was. These horrors are real, but this book offers a beacon of hope, providing an escape from the torment for those who receive salvation through Jesus. Log on to Lori Ditto's webpage and get your copy today. Welcome back. I'm just telling you about a vision of hell where my granddaughter is on the wrong side. Her name is Jerusalem. I am screaming her name like you wouldn't believe. Jerusalem, come back. You see, I could not go over there because I am a child of God. I'm a child of light. I had not been commissioned by God. Believers can't go over into the dark unless God fixes it for you to go over into the dark or you will get lost too. So I had to stand there and only call out her name. And every time she'd look back, what would happen is they would try and draw her attention with some doodad that was much too old for her. It was things like, oh, would you like to drive a car? What little girl can drive a car? They did not care about her life they just wanted to keep her in the dark side. And I kept crying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, please come back, come back. It was all I could do. And I watched other children getting through. That dark side is trickier than what you realize. It will grab you. It will grab your loved ones. It will take you over there. We need to pay attention, pay attention. What are you doing? And so as she was over there, I began crying out to Jesus. I need your help, Lord. I need your help. This is too big for me. And in an instant, the Lord was beside her. I said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, cry out to God. And she said his name. Now she was little. But she knew enough about Jesus to know that your best friend is Jesus. The superhero is Jesus. There's no one better. And when you cry out to Jesus, he can make all always better. Jesus will help you. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. And she knew that much, but that was more than enough. And when he asked her, can I bring you with me? She must have said yes, because it was a whirlwind. He, he spun her up. He took her out of that darkness in no time at all. And he was bringing her back to this side of the boundary. It was so intense. 
the wall over that time had, had grown really big. So even if she had wanted to, she could not have scaled this slippery wall to get back on this side. But there's no place God won't go. There's nothing he won't do to save you. He cried out, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And you know, in the scriptures, he cried out, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He's talking about the real city, a real group of people. And Jesus desires for them to also know him as savior and be saved. And maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe right now you need to realize you're in a dark side. The only way out of there because of all of the tricks that Satan has put on you is just to cry out to the Savior, Jesus Christ, the glorious one, the one who always helps. Do you know in the scripture, every time they cried out, Jesus, will you help me? The Lord never said no, never. That's because it's not in him to say no. It's in him to help you. But you have to do your part. You have to hate where you are, hate the pain, hate the bondage, hate the suffering, hate the sickness, and cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ and tell him you want to be his child. And maybe you are his child and you're on the wrong side. Get out of there. What type of sin is worth spending eternity in hell where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth? I want to pray for you. And right now, because it's such an important prayer, I feel I need to just do something. I'm just going to get down on my knees when it's, when it's an important prayer. The best place before the Lord is on your knees. Cry out, Jesus, help me. Get me out of the darkness. I've been there before. I know where you are. The only person that can help you is Jesus. Just say his name. Just say the word help. And he will, because he does. Lord Jesus, I pray for my friend right now who's trying to get out of this darkness. You are so much stronger than Satan. He's got nothing on you. You will help them. Right now, in Jesus' name, I bless you to feel the mighty God coming into your situation, breaking in in your situation, because you are important to him. You are loved. You're cherished. You're needed. God bless you.